Welcome to Strip Cover Alert, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I am Adrian Ford, and we are here for the 25th chapter, as I knock the desk and ruin everything. Yeah. Fairy Tale by Stephen King. So what we've got here is we have a couple comments to go over, and then we have a So What Happened portion, a Lit Crit portion, and finally a writer's circle portion for this video. But if you've gotten to the 25th video in this series and you somehow weren't familiar with the format, I have to ask you other questions. So if you want to help me out with what I'm doing here, hitting the like button as always does the trick. Let's get into things. Freddie has a question on writing and he says, Characters always have, quote, wet, in quote, eyes in literature. What does it mean to have dry eyes? Well, this herein, we get into a little bit of an argument. I think it's from Derrida that says everything that a text does not, everything that a text says, it also says the opposite. In that, what we are doing is setting something aside. So, if a character is denoted as having wet eyes, that is, being glassy-eyed, regular eyes would be the non-wet, dry eyes, or the matte eyes, perhaps. But it's an interesting argument, and it is an argument that can get us down some very troublesome paths. So, for example, if so if dry eyes are the normal that is eyes that are not quite glassy eyes that don't look quite as if someone were about to cry dry eyes are normal you don't have to say eyes look dry so when you have a text that has four characters in it for example and all of a sudden, a character is introduced, and we spend a whole lot of time talking about that character's skin color. We denote that that character is black, for example. Well, the author didn't introduce the other characters as white. Does that mean that to this author, white is normal? See, it's very easy to get lost in these, um, it's called, they're critical theories, right? But theory doesn't really mean anything in this um, fashion. It, 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 it's really just a school of thought. The, it's a lens, really. It's not a theory, but a lot of the people that are in English wanted to sound very smart and very important and very pretentious. So we we aped these terms from these science departments and we called them our own and said that, well, we deserve grants too, don't we? So when you start looking at these ideas, these theories like this that say everything that an author doesn't say, he or she must be implying. It's a very easy way to get lost in a text. It's a very easy way to get lost in some type of theory. It's a very easy way to raise whatever problem you want to raise. And sometimes the criticism is warranted. But sometimes we're just being prickly. Crybaby Films says, <clears throat> There is a song called Finesse by Bruno Mars featuring Cardi B that is totally fresh. I, you might be right, maybe it is totally fresh. I, however, cannot listen to Cardi B when she's singing with other men. I get too jealous. So what happened in this, the 25th chapter of Fairy Tale? They get a full-on banquet after the first, for being the survivors of the first round of the fair one, which doesn't particularly seem very fair, does it? Maybe it's fair, but not equitable. After the banquet, 
Amit and Iota confront Charlie about their escape. No one knows how to get it done. And they uh, retire for the evening. In the middle of the night, a giant red cricket makes its way through the wall and over to Charlie. It is the cricket from earlier, the cricket that Charlie saved from being tortured. How? This cricket found its way to someone who would leave a note for Charlie on said cricket? I don't know. I do it doesn't matter, right? Uh, we're already talking about all of these weird and wild things. We can get away with this one. Stephen can get away with this one. The cricket has a note from Claudia asking if, quote, they, end quote, could help. And was Charlie alive? Charlie replies that he is alive and to come if they are many, but not if they are few. Percy sneaks Charlie some instructions, and then it's day two of the tournament. When Charlie realizes they should pour water on the electric boogaloo guards, that is how you kill them. Turns out, it doesn't just kill them, they explode in very dangerous fashion, and shrapnel in the way of bones might get you if you're not prepared, and the prisoners make a run for. Um, they just go on a night soldier killing spree, and Charlie gets to take out Aaron, and that makes him very happy. So, we're moving into the lit crit portion of this video. This video, and I am realizing, and this is going to sound hypercritical, and I don't mean it to. I don't mean this to be one of those, I'm not being persnickety right here. I think I'm just putting something out there that is fairly obvious at this point in the novel. This all feels very derivative. And okay, most forms of literature are to some extent, to some degree. But most movies have references to other movies. Most books have references to other books. Most TV shows have references to other TV shows, whether that is just through the list of actors that they use, whether it is through tropes that fit inside a 30-minute time period, whether it is the literary references to the Bible, because at one point in time, the Bible was basically the only book you could have been sure that your entire audience would have read. These are things that work their way into every medium. Hunger Games is in here. Harry Potter is in here. Um, Game of Thrones is in here. He-Man is in here. We get a direct reference to He-Man and the look of the Night Soldiers. Here's what I wonder. I've read The Shining. I've read it, I've read Carrie, I've read several Stephen King's. I didn't get this in those other books. Stephen King always wanted to have quotes from uh, songs which are conspicuously absent herein because presumably because Stephen King is not of the generation that is Charlie. So how is he going to quote Cardi B and Bruno Mars when he doesn't know the songs. Is this something that happened in The Shining? But I am so unfamiliar with pop culture. Because these are pop culture references. These aren't just book references. These are mainly, it would seem, references to television shows and things like that. Are these things which happen in The Shining, happen in it, to the same extent. And I don't mean just references. I mean themes and tropes and whatnot ripped from those other things. The, the idea of the tournament, the idea of the tournament while the rich people watch, the idea of being the hidden prince, all of these things. right? And the hidden prince, obviously, is great big through all forms of literature and and probably movies and TV shows as well. But are these things which are in The Shining, but I am unfamiliar with pop culture of the 70s? Are these things which have found their way into the pages of it, but I am unfamiliar with the 
standard pop culture of the 80s, of the mid-80s? I don't know. If anyone, if anyone here was around then, I would love to hear about this in the comments section. It's something that I find very interesting. The next thing that I have here, do we trust Percy? I think this is a question worth asking. Do we trust Percy? Percy is someone who found his way to Charlie and somehow through the osmosis of prison uh, took in the idea that Charlie was the prince and then went with it. But when we are first thrown into this prison, Percy is with the people. Percy is uh, not imprisoned. Percy is seen, I think, well, he works in coordination with the night soldier guards. How is he not one of them? Um, oh no. I forgot to, I forgot to write the page number in my notes for this. So maybe I will just have to remember roughly what's going on at the point in time. Um, Charlie has said, Charlie mentions that Amit and Iota are looking to him for the advice, which is really kind of terrifying because he should be a senior in high school. Um, and this is something that I was thinking about recently, uh, ironically, maybe not ironically, but coincidentally, perhaps, being from Kansas City with Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes is 27. Patrick Mahomes is playing in his third Super Bowl. He had just got through hosting his fifth consecutive AFC Championship game. Going back to the beginning of that AFC champion, and I know this is, this is, it's not really important to know the terms I'm throwing around right now, but um, if you are not a football fan, AFC championship game right next to the Super Bowl. The game before the Super Bowl, nobody makes it that far, right? There are four teams in the NFL playing on that level. His first one, he would have been 23. I mean, what was I doing at 23? Scraping together quarters to pay rent and do my laundry. You know what I mean? So I think, um, especially with war, and we're getting maybe not war, but combat here, right? These things are often uh, perpetrated by characters much younger than we really imagine them. So, for example, the guys that hoisted the flag in Iwo Jima, you've seen the the uh, statue, no doubt. Those guys were like 21, 22 years old. Um, the Alexander the Great, if I'm not mistaken, Alexander the Great died at like 36. So the Alexander the Great that you think of, when you think of Alexander the Great sort of conquering all of these nations was like 24. We're in, in our world, 24-year-olds don't do anything. Right? Um, so these this idea of the young person, I think sometimes, if you are the young person who is destined for bigger things, you are doing those bigger things at a younger and younger age, then many people would actually be able to um, comprehend. And you just do them because you're doing them. That is what seems to happen with, uh, so for example, athletes, which I know, not great people, but the heroes sort of of our day, they're told just play the game. Don't think about the stage, just play the game. That would have been what was happening. Um, in, in the time of Alexander the Great, he was just being him. Some of the things he did, we can look back on and chagrin, but at the time, that was the way the world worked. That was the way that things happened, right? Um, and the final sort of literary criticism that I have for this chapter, oi, oi. Where did this come from all of a sudden? Am I 
misremembering the first 24 chapters of this book in thinking that that particular terminology was not associated with these characters, with the knights. Oi, where are you going, oi? Um, anyway, that sort of leads me into the main thing that I want to talk about with the writer's circle notes here. And it circles around Percy, and it circles around things just sort of popping up in the text, because it seems, and again, who's going to edit Stephen King? Who's going to tell Stephen King, you can't do this, you got to put this there, you got to move that around? Nobody, right? So, okay. But in that case, if you're Stephen King, you have to take it on your shoulders to be the one that makes your things make sense. Percy comes in and offers Charlie, hey, maybe you want to revolt, right? He does this before the first round. He does this before the first round. Hey, I'm just saying, seems you might be the prince. If you need a hand, let me know. I got some smarts. I know some things. I got some connections. I can pass you some notes. You'll know a couple things. He does that before the first round. And then Charlie goes and lets eight people die. And then decides to revolt. Now, okay, maybe Charlie's a bit of a dunce. And we can accept that. Uh, Charlie has exhibited zero drive and determination to break out of this prison since he got there. Maybe it's just now occurring to him after killing a man. And even though he knew half of his friends were going to die, letting them die, now he just decides, ah, we got to do something about this. All right? We got to we gotta make, make this go a little smoother. Now, Charlie wants to revolt and break out of prison. Wouldn't it have made more sense for Percy to have been in on the talk of Charlie being the chosen one, but being doubtful. Maybe then we could even assume it was Percy who told um, Kellen that Charlie might be the chosen one. And what if Percy decided, after watching Charlie's performance against Claw in the first round. Oh my God, this really is the chosen one. This is the guy. I got to help out. And then he gets back to the cell and then Percy offers help. Because this way, the way it's written now, Charlie just decided to let half of his friends get murdered in epic fashion. And, by the by, during a revolt like this, it's never the case that everyone's going to make it. So you made your own journey, you made your own escape a little bit more doubtful because maybe if you had decided before round one, Hamie decides, we're in a tough spot, I'm going to go ahead and sacrifice myself. Then Hamie's death is worthwhile. Then Hamie's death has redemption. Then Hamy goes from just pitiful character to a hero. These are all things that could have been done. And look, guys, this is what we've read. This is what's to go. There's going to be loose ends. There's going to be things that don't get tied together. There's going to be endings here that don't feel complete. There's going to be things here that are rushed. Why did we make this decision to have Charlie allow half of his friends to be murdered without giving them actual fun deaths? What in fact, what if Claw shows up And instead of the fact that the rich folk 
like to have one easy death first, which is what uh, Kellen said at the beginning when he decided to have Jaya and Hamy go at it because Jaya was going to kill him real easy. He was Hamy. What if they wanted to start off with a real hard one? They wanted to start off with a real cutthroat battle. And then that guy, maybe he'd get a bye week or two, like Patrick Mahomes going to the Super Bowl. Like Patrick Mahomes skipping the, divi skipping the wild card round of the playoffs and jumping straight in at the divisional round. Maybe they had set up that, oh, well, Charlie and Claw, somebody's getting a bye week for the next one. Well, you know, we'll throw the two big guys out there first, and after that, he's earned himself a bye week. You know what I mean? And after Charlie goes ahead and kills Claw, he decides, this is wild. Something's got, some. this can't happen. And then Percy comes to him and says, hey, I understand maybe you are the prince, okay? Probably you need to go because Kellen has it out for you. Because I told Kellen that everyone here thinks you're the prince. And maybe you are. And now that he's seen this, I mean, he he might Commodus you, right? Remember Commodus and the gladiators shivs him before the match? Okay. Then we have a whole lot more compelling action than just people sitting in a cell. And the last thing that I have here, flawed as I believe these chapters have been, um, miscalculated as I believe they have been, they sure have been a whole lot easier to read, haven't they? They sure have gone a whole lot faster, haven't they? This is because Stephen King is hitting his stride as a writer. He is not questioning things. He is not... The first half of this book felt very labored. Then we get to Impus, and it feels very tenuously written. Um... And now, Stephen King has broken into stride. What he's, and I think what this is, and I think this is why this is an important note, Stephen King is in his characters now. Stephen King is not introducing Charlie's world. Stephen King is not introducing the world of Impus. Stephen King is concentrating herein on the characters at play. And that is where the best writing happens. That is all I have for this video. I hope to have you back next week for the 26th chapter of Fairy Tale. I am back on Monday with poetry because on Mondays we have poetry. And if you find yourself here by chance but not designed, consider hitting the subscribe button. And if you want to help me out with what I'm doing here on the channel, it always does the trick if you decide to hit that like button.